And so what do you say we set up the hypothesis that the mean has not changed and see if we can contradict that hypothesis in the light of our data. We're really dealing with, in this case, a uh, simple test of the hypothesis that um, the mean has, uh, is um, still equal to 28. So the null hypothesis in this case is that the mean performance is still leaving 28% of charge remaining. And the alternative hypothesis is that we have improved the situation so that we think, hopefully, that the new mean is greater than eta zero. We're interested, therefore, in doing a one-tail test of significance. And we evoke our old friend, the normal deviant, as you well recall. And when you plug in the necessary data here, you'll find out the average was 30. The null hypothesis about the mean was 28. You divide down by the square root of the variance of the statistic one-fifth times 20. Z comes out equal to 1. Now, this is a one-tail test. And pray, um, what is the critical value of Z when we're doing a one-tail test? 1.64. And our observed value of Z is, alas, not larger than 1.64. So the data could not be used to contradict the hypothesis that the mean was equal to 28. Alas, lads, back to the drawing boards or back to the golf course to get some more data in the hope that we can, in a sense, obtain sufficient precision in our statistic to enable us to reject the hypothesis that the mean is still equal to 28. Of course, you might more realistically be interested in an interval estimate for the mean performance of these new batteries. After all, a lot of money and time has gone into manufacturing these new batteries. And so what can we say about the mean performance of these new batteries in the light of our data? And to do that, we'd want to make an interval statement. So what do you say we make a 95% interval statement uh, for a parameter? And of course, the parameter that we're concerned with in this instance is the mean. And so we'd like to make an interval estimate for the mean. Okay? Now, how would we make the interval estimate for the mean? Well, it's interesting because we can generalize the use of the normal deviate again. And we do it in the following fashion. We can actually take the statistic, whatever statistic we're dealing with, plus or minus 1.96 times the square root of the variance of that statistic. Now, the statistic has to be a linear combination of the observations, okay? And of course, what statistic will we be dealing with? Our statistic will be the one that estimates the parameter we're concerned with, the mean. When we get all the way through with this particular calculation, we will have an interval statement for the mean, you see, given by the statistic, which will be the average, plus or minus 1.96 times the variance of that statistic. And so here you see it. The statistic we're involved with is y bar, plus or minus 1.96 times the square root of sigma squared over n. That will give us the limits, see the confidence limits, for this particular parameter, the mean. Well, gee whiz, if you plug in there and turn the crank, y bar was 30 and the variance of the statistic is 1 fifth times 20. And the two values we get in this case, the low value for eta, the lowest reasonable limit for eta was 26.08, and the highest was 33.92. 26 and 34, effectively. And how do we interpret this particular interval statement for the mean? We say all values of eta which lie inside this interval are not contradicted by the data. Now, this is a 95% interval statement uh, for the mean performance of the, um, of the batteries. Okay. Well, very, very good indeed. Now, I tell you, we ought to think in terms of another example which sort of does generalize and extend what we've currently learned. So I want you to imagine we're in a situation where we have two brands of cake mix, brand A and brand B. And what we're going to try to do is uh, try to determine uh, which of these uh, two cake mixes uh, leaves the um, uh, cake most moist. In other words, we're going to take a moisture uh, uh, measurement on these cakes and so forth to find out which of the two brands gives us the most moist cake or what are the measures of moisture between these two brands. And so we have brand A and brand B cake mix. And so what we did was to manufacture some cakes and take measurements on their moisture and to see what we could determine. So let's come over here to the board and see what the data looked like. Now we have really uh, simplified this example a great deal. Uh, these measurements, five, seven, and six, are measures of moisture on cakes manufactured from brand A cake mix. Uh, the average turned out to be six. And for brand B, we only had two cakes at our disposal when we came to take the moisture measurements. And those, the average of those two observations is four. 
The variance of this data taking procedure uh, when you take moisture measurements on cakes happens to be equal to 30 units squared. Now what is the essential statistic that we're interested in? You would say, well, what are you actually trying to do between these two brands? You're trying to compare the two brands. You're trying to contrast the two brands. And so the essential parameter is A to A minus A to B. And so what would be the essential statistic? What statistic estimates that parameter? R, Y bar A minus Y bar B. So our statistic, the statistic that's critical to our discussion here, is the difference between the two averages, which in this instance comes out equal to two, and there's the parameter that, that statistic estimates, A to A minus A to B. Now, what do you say we go out and test the hypothesis that there is no difference between the two brands? Brand A is just the same as brand B relative to the moisture content in the cakes, okay? Hopefully, we might want to reject this hypothesis, and that would make us decide on one brand or the other. But let's set up that particular point hypothesis, okay? So here we go. Let's go back to the board now and see if we can uh, set up this hypothesis. First of all, let's see what we're dealing with with respect to the normal deviate. The normal deviate in this case will be equal to the statistic, the difference between the two averages, minus the parameter it estimates, divided down by the square root of the variance of that statistic. What's the variance of the statistic, gang? It's one over the number of observations in the first average plus one over the number of observations in the second average. This is the very statistic that we looked at earlier in which there were three observations in the first average and two observations in the second average. So if we were to plug in our data, we find out our observed value of the normal deviate would be six minus four. See, that's the two that we recognize. The hypothesized value for the difference between the means is zero. And downstairs is the square root of the variance of that statistic. One third plus one half sigma squared, which in this example is 30. That gives us an observed value of z equal to 0 0.4. It turns out in this case that we're doing a two-tailed test since we don't care which way that difference comes out away from zero. Both, both ways would be critical of the null hypothesis. But our observed value of z is very small and it is clear we do not have enough data here uh, to reject the hypothesis that the difference between the two means is zero. Okay? Well, now suppose you wanted to make an interval statement for the true difference between the means of those two cake mixes. Well, how would you do that? The 95% uh, interval estimate uh, for a parameter. Now, what's the parameter we're dealing with in this case? The parameter we're dealing with in this case is the difference between the uh, two means. And so that would be given by the equivalent statistic, plus or minus the square root of 1.96 times the square root of the variance of that statistic. So well, here it is in general terms again. And uh, what would it be for uh, our particular problem? We're anxious to make an interval statement for A to A minus A to B. Uh, what's the statistic? The statistic is the difference between the two averages. Okay, okay. plus or minus 1.96 times the square root of the variance of that particular statistic. And what's the variance of that statistic? One over NA plus one over NB sigma squared. So dumping in the data. We get six minus four, plus or minus 1.96, square root of one third, see, plus one half sigma squared. And uh, if you turn that crank, you'll find out that, that comes out about equal to 10. And so our interval statement here is two minus 10, which would be minus eight, and uh, two plus 10, which would be minus 12. And in the light of this very limited quantity of data, and given the large variance we're dealing with, this is what we can say about the difference between A to A minus A to B. All possible values of A to A minus A to B, which fall between these two limits, are not contradicted by the data. Now, this is a 95% confidence statement. Okay. Well, now you've learned how to generalize the use of the normal deviate, both for doing tests of hypotheses and for making interval statements about the parameter. The only hook in the system is the fact that the, stati the statistic that you grind out has to be a linear combination of the observations. Well, what does this tell us about the design of experiments? This idea of contrasting, of comparing two treatments or two brands or two modes of operation and so forth, this is a very frequently encountered problem. And what does the uh, statistician have to tell us when it comes to collecting data on such a problem of comparing or contrasting two treatments, let's say. Okay, suppose I gave you money to run 12 experiments, right? You're sitting there with money to run 12 experiments. How would you spend your 12 experiments 
to study the difference between two modes of operating your plant, say, or between brand A and brand B, if that were the problem. Well, most of you would say, gee whiz, put six observations in one average and six observations in the other. Your intuition would come through and that's what you'd likely do. It turns out that's the correct answer, but do you know why? Okay, the reason why is because it forces the variance of the statistic to be what is called the minimum variance estimate. You see, y bar A minus y bar B would now have a minimum variance. We would have made the constant that goes in front of sigma squared as small as possible. If you plug six observations in one of the averages and six observations in the other average, the constant in front of sigma squared ends up equaling one third. But suppose you had gotten sort of enamored with process B and you ran eight experiments on process B, and then, oh, gee whiz, four experiments for process A. And now what would the variance of your statistic be? The difference between the two averages, which is the relevant statistic, would have the following variance. And you notice that's larger than one-third sigma squared. So by being careless in the way you designed the experiment, and the way you collected the data relative to the important statistic you were out for, you artificially and unnecessarily inflated the variance of the statistic. When you inflate the variance of the statistic, what happens to the interval estimate? It's wider than it has to be. So you know less about the essential parameters that you're attempting to study. <laughs> Suppose the guy had gotten really enamored of process B and took 11 observations on process B and then, oh my gracious, I have to get something for A and he takes one observation for A. Well, what's the variance of his statistic look like? It's a pretty uh, sad affair, isn't it? It's 1 plus 1 11 sigma squared. 11 observations in y bar b, only one observation in y bar a. And he's got a statistic now which has a variance larger than a single observation. And you know, you could carry this to an extreme. Uh, Supposing he'd taken all his observations on process b and none on process a, right? Well, first of all, you can't compute the statistic, does it? Essential. And what about the variance of that statistic? Well, you'd have, you know, 1 over 0 plus 1 over 12, and 1 over 0 is infinity, and, you know, got a pretty wide confidence in it. Okay. Well, we'll learn a good deal more as the course develops here on how to construct statistics which are minimum variance estimates of the parameters that we're out for, and that's a very important attribute of the design of experiments. Now, there's a lot more to go. First of all, we're going to have to learn how to estimate sigma squared. We haven't told you how to do that yet, have we? And then we're going to have to learn how to replace z by, uh, other, uh, by some other statistic. When we don't know sigma squared, we no longer can compute, you know, the normal deviate. And so, like Columbus, we're sailing out into the sea of the unknown in statistics. And be patient, as those sailors were, ultimately patient with Columbus. <laughs> well, I tell you, it's been a long afternoon and I think uh, what I'll do while you lads uh, head back to your work is um, I'll pour a little more of this uh, reagent in uh, one of these beakers. I'll take a lot of this <coughs> oh my and just a touch of that and uh, one of these and uh, be of good cheer.